Thank you. Praise and worship team. Thank you, church. Good morning, everybody. Haven't seen you in a while. You all look uh, a little older than the last time I saw you. Thank you. Thank you for... Uh, Thank you for everything, for having the opportunity to get away. I just uh, was whispering to somebody, I said, this uh, long vacation thing is really something else. I might have to do it like every month, I don't know. No, I don't think so. I would not be working here any longer. So it is good to be back. I missed everything that First Bible Baptist Church stands for. And I am so thankful, most of all, for all of you. Missed you all so very much. Uh, for those of you that did not miss me, um, that's okay. We had some great people filling in, and uh, uh, we can cover that in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, which is where we're going to go if I'm Apollos or Cephas or whatever. But what a team of men and women here to serve the Lord and the tremendous work that was accomplished over the last few weeks without me being here reminds me that I just don't need to be here. But I absolutely love being here, so uh, we'll keep on going. There's a lot more work to be done. The rest, uh, the rest and the refreshment was great. And again, I'm thankful. Uh, Cheryl and I had a chance to go up and see her dad, which was great. And then she went back to work, which was even greater, and that was better. And uh, I spent a few weeks doing some things around the home that uh, just needed to be done. Uh, a lot of cerebral activity, a lot of thinking, and and communicating in communion with the Lord, which was really, really good and profitable. And uh, came back for Monday and ADP Sports Charity Golf Tournament. Woohoo! What a tremendous, tremendous event. Everything done with excellent in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God receive glory. I'll give you a report on the financial aspect of it as soon as we're able to work through things. Uh, thank you, volunteers, everyone that was part of that. Uh, thank you for everyone that uh, signed in, signed up, uh, put their monies in after we pay the bills. We'll let you know what money we were able to raise for sleep and heavenly peace. And we'll be able also, too, to build some beds. We'll be doing that on Sunday. Uh, I believe it's September 18th after second service at noontime. Uh, all of you are looking at your chief schedule. Don't worry. The chiefs don't come into play in that. And even if they did, it would be better to build a bed so some little child would know what it means to sleep on a bed and also to give us the opportunity to minister to one another and to go out and to meet people and talk to people and continue to touch the lives of the community that we are in with the gospel. You are the gospel. You are the living word of God in Jesus and Jesus in you. And that's part of uh, 1 Corinthians 3. We're going to start up in verse number 10 if you want to go there. I'm going to do a little review here in a minute, but... Uh, again, uh, thank you for the time away. Thank you for praying and, and your support and the gift of time and monies and everything that was involved and went together with all of that. And uh, again, I'm, I'm glad to be back. Uh, Bobby, thank you for preaching the Word of God tremendously uh, and doing such a great job. Of course, Josh Bennett and the crew uh, that did the youth ministry celebration. I watched that on TV. It was tremendous and well done. And uh, uh, on the Facebook thing or whatever they got, you know, my wife did the Facebook thing. I guess you can watch that stuff. And I just wait till YouTube puts it up there and I watch. Uh, I'm one of the five or ten views, but uh, I'm very thankful for that. I, I know how to do that technology, but uh, but anyway, it was really really good to to know. I know Steve did a tremendous job last week. I know that when I called him, um, he kind of yeah, he was just pretty excited. He was fired up. And I said, the first group, I said, it's good to see that uh, Steve still does not get very excited when he preaches the word of God. I can see that. on, But, uh, but it was good to know that the men that are here uh, to preach and teach the word of God, the women that are here to teach and to lead in so many other areas, the servanthood, uh, thank you uh, for the camaraderie that has been built in the word of God and in the spirit of God through everything. Uh, the VBSC celebration was great. Um, all of those bits and pieces, I know that everything continues. It's a reminder for each and every one of us. This life that you have been given is a very precious gift. And you are the stewards of such a life, the manifold 
riches. You are stewards. We are stewards of everything. And even this morning as we get into the Word of God, you are stewards of the Word of God, believers. You have been given the precious living Word of God to read, to study, to memorize, to meditate upon. You have access through Jesus Christ, the one mediator, to go to the Father and speak and talk to Him and commune with Him. You have the Holy Spirit of God in you, believer, that has sealed you to the day of redemption, sealed you with a promise. Steve, it was so powerful just to hear you talk about Jesus and not about you. And it's powerful because it's not us. It's him in us. And you're a new creature in Christ. And I know that. And you just testified, hey, I just want to tell you what Jesus did for me. Forgiven. Redeemed. Powerful. And that is the beginning point of a new life in Christ. And so what are you doing with your new life? We'll get there in a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. If you see the first few verses there, you're reminded of where we were last time we were together. And you're reminded that Paul is still speaking to them about some of the division stuff, some of the strife. He's talking about them. Hey, am I having to speak to you as people that still just spiritually can take milk and just basic like lower like lower end stuff you can know some doctrine but not very much you don't want to get into the word of god too much you're now saying you're a paul of cephas you've got divisions over following man instead of following jesus and of course those first nine verses we covered and we called it messy business that was july 17th the last time i spoke in this series we are in on studying first corinthians with all 16 chapters we are get the third chapter behind us today and we have a little ways to go to finish up but this is a wonderful study in reminding us that love never fails that's Paul's communicating heart in the spirit to say look I'm going to teach you all the things I need to teach you to get back to the foundation which is Jesus but it might be messy business the first part about messy business is when he showed up at Corinth and around 51, 52 A.D., and that church was planted and started. We find it in Acts chapter number 18. He's preaching and teaching the word of God. He is proclaiming the gospel. Many souls get saved. People like Crispus and Sosthenes, who are actually Jewish magistrates working for the rulers at that time, they come to the Lord. In fact, he gets so the, the leaders get so upset with Crispus that they get rid of him. And they put Sosthenes in place of him. And then, of course, when we start the letter in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, and we'll even reference that a little bit, he says, hey, I'm speaking to you, my brother. This is the apostle Paul and my brother Sosthenes. So you think, wow, this was messy to start with. All these people that worship false gods. They come to know Jesus Christ. So they're lost and messy. Then they get saved and they're messy. And now they have to be discipled. They need to learn the word of God. They need to learn doctrine. Remember when you first got saved and that was, that was a place of, hey, maybe you got saved out of messiness. Or maybe it's been messy because the second half of the messy business is what we looked at in those nine verses last time, which was this. It's tough to grow sometimes. It's tough to get a handle on the things of the Lord and be taught the right doctrine. There's a lot of false doctrine going along. There's a lot of man worship going along. There's a lot of accolades and value put in the wisdom of man and the wisdom of the world. And that's Paul referencing that constantly saying, look. He that planted and watereth their one, every man received his own reward. We said, look, God got the increase. The messy business is when we get in the way of the messiness. Instead of saying, God, I know I'm a mess. I know it's going to be messy, but I know this is nothing beyond or outside of your job description to make me the way you want me to be. I'm predestinated to be conformed to the image of Christ at the moment of salvation. That now has changed everything about me. And when you got saved, born again, your life became new. And so the messy business 
is, number one, lost people that are a mess getting saved. And secondly, the messy converted person now being discipled to learn what it means. And remember what Paul said, learn what it means to live as the spiritual man. Because now you're no longer the carnal man. But he enters in and says, hey, there's this, excuse me, excuse me, natural man and the spiritual man, but there's also this carnal man. And when he says, hey, all those people that are saved, they're spiritual people. All those people that are lost, they're still natural man. But now when you're born again, there's the possibility that you become a carnal man. And I asked that question. I said, hey, are you in that place? What kind of person are you today as a believer or as a lost person? Are you, are you the natural man? You're still unconverted. Maybe you've never called on the name of the Lord and meant it. Maybe you've never said, okay, God, I understand that I'm a sinner. I understand that Jesus Christ came for my sin. And you know what? God, be merciful to me. I don't, I, there's nothing I can do to save myself. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's the goodness of God that leadeth to repentance. Godly sorrow worketh in repentance. Finally, I say, God, I no longer want to be this natural lost person. I want to get saved. And maybe that's you today. Or maybe you're the spiritual man that's wrestling with the carnal man. Sometimes you favor the flesh. Sometimes you favor the things of yourself. Sometimes you favor the wisdom of this world when you know the wisdom of God is the best way to go. And you say, God... How did I get to the place that I'm getting? I need someone to show me how to live. I need someone to have to walk with Jesus Christ. I need somebody to teach me what it means to worship and commune with God and know that I can have this incredible life. In fact, as Jesus said, abundant life. I came to give an abundant life, he says in John chapter number 10. So when we brought this message around last time, we said, hey, you know what? There's a lot of people out there that would love to have someone teach them. There's also a lot of people out there that would say, I could teach somebody the Word of God. Not just in a cerebral exchange or a knowledge-to-knowledge, intellect-to-intellect exchange, but rather life-to-life. That I would be willing to learn if someone would teach me, and you would say, I'd be willing to teach someone. That's messy business. This was our conclusion at the end of the message. I asked you this question up on the screen. It says, will you seek God's direction to be a disciple maker in the lives of those who need discipleship? Oh, you've got a bunch of pastors on staff. Why don't they just handle it? Okay, we'll do our part. We've got no problem with that. None of these guys have ever said no. Whoever and whatever you want me to do, Lord, I'll do it. Every one of them. But there's also you. You, some of you have been saved 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I didn't mean to look at you, Craig. You're not even 50. I mean, I didn't mean that. You're saved in your mom's womb, of course. Some of you have learned the word of God up down, in and out. You know the breadth and the height. You know and you understand and comprehend the love of God. You love the word of God. Some of you teach the Bible, but when it comes to messy business, well, one-on-one -on -one with somebody, a couple on couple, that's too much. Oh, God. No, it's not too much. It's difficult and hard, but raising children today is hard. Fostering children's hard. Adopting children's hard. Caring for someone else's children's heart. Being a teacher is difficult right now. I said to someone recently, I said, if you're not there for those children in the classroom, who's going to be there? Well, if you're not there for someone who's eager to learn the word of God, who do you think is going to be there? This world and the devil are waiting to eat someone's lunch in about 10 seconds. And they will eat it well. The flesh will eat back at the Holy Spirit. And then that person won't know how to get into the Word of God. And they'll hear, study to show thyself a prudent of God. A workman that not in the thought to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the Word of truth. Well, who's going to show me how to do that? Well, you know what? I'll throw this out at you. 
while you're waiting for someone to be obedient to God, open up the Bible. It will not disappoint you. Anywhere it's... Okay, I want to make sure that's still in vogue here. Read the book of Romans. Read the four Gospels. Send me an email. Send Brian an email. Send Dwayne. Call him. Text him. Call Doc. He's retired. What? Real quick, how many of you in here are retired from a regular vocational job? Would you raise your hand, please? Gotcha. But it's not me. Forget about me. I'm not Apollos or Cephas. It's Jesus. He's got you. Some of you raising your hands. I know some of you. You know the word of God better than I do. You can walk through the word of God. You can show somebody. You can lean on the Holy Spirit. And you can say, hey, I'm willing to get into the messy business. So that was our message. So today when you think about love never fails, when you say, well, you know, I look up there and I see that, I go, love never fails. Love never fails. I don't know if I got the right kind of love. God has to continue to work in your heart and my heart because love never fails. By this shall all men that know that you're my disciples, that you have a love one for another, Jesus Christ. This love, love others, is talking about our love for one another. That's really this love that we're talking about. He's talking about the church at Corinth. Well, I love all the lost. I'm talking about if you cannot love one another, then how is anybody going to say that I agree with, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have a love one for another. Greater love had no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You know the verses. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, that agape love, I am nothing. That's God's pure love that came to you when you got saved, born again, in Jesus' name, in the Holy Spirit. Now you're going to get into the Word of God. You can't change this formula. Sorry. Stop trying to find some alternative way to be sanctified for the Master's use. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, verse 8, charity never faileth. But whether it be prophecies, some of you like to tell prophecies, that's awesome. They shall fail. Whether it be tongues, some of you have the ability to speak all kinds of different languages, plus some of you talk, and I can't even understand your language, so I don't understand that. But they shall cease. And maybe you would say that about me as well. I went up north for a few days. I got a little bit of northern back to me, I tell you. It says there, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. All that stuff is nothing if you have not charity. Charity comes from on high through the sun. Moses came and he brought the law, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. It is him. It's always been him. It says in verse number 9, For we are laborers together with God, and ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. We'll use this as a kickoff and a launching spot for our message today. That was our last verse of the message a few weeks ago. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Recognize the words here. We are laborers together. We work together. And then we work some more. The work of God continue to work together and partner with one another will not be in vain. In the name of Jesus, working together is what God's calling us to do. We are to be laborers together in this field. The husbandry. Ye are God's husbandry. The word means very simply cultivated field. Church, you are and I am and we're part of the cultivated field. He wants to cultivate you when you get born again and you're saved and you're a new creature. It's from the work of the husbandman. Do you know who the husbandman is? Do you know who the true vine is? John chapter number 15. Well, you know all those things, Pastor. You're, I know, I'm supposed to. But they didn't come by somebody downloading them in my brain. Just like you. All of you learn because you went after it. 
You wanted to be a worker in the word first. You wanted to learn how to worship him and walk with him. You didn't want to jump in and say, I want to work in 10 ministries. If you are not in the word, you will fall. I promise you because the work of the ministry will wear you out. You need to be solid in your doctrine. We'll get there in a minute. You have to be solid in your sanctification. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Be the cultivated field. Ye are, Paul is saying, we are God's husbandry. He also says, we are God's building. What's the building? Figuratively speaking, it is really simply this. It's a confirmation of edification. Building means edification. Edification means building up. The act of one who promotes growth in Christian wisdom, happiness, holiness, the husbandman is the land worker. He's the farmer. He's the tiller of the soil. Do you know he's the vine dresser? Do you know the father in heaven is the husbandman dressed the vine? That's doctrine. That's the truth. As Jesus gives glory to his father, he realizes his father, the husbandman of his life, he's the farmer of his life who dressed the vine so that the vine could be the true vine. Paul tells the Corinthian people here that they are laborers together in their God's building. So I ask you today, how's our building doing? Look around. You know I'm not referring to this, am I? Now look around at one another. It's okay. People think you're getting a little weird, but go ahead and stare at everybody around you now. Come on now, stare. Stare, everybody. Stare, everybody. I want the first three rows to stand up and stare back at everybody. Gosh, I go away and no one wants to do what I ask them to do. <laughs> Things haven't changed, have they, Ben? You thought I wasn't joking. I was serious, though. This is the building. You are to be building this personal temple that he made for you in Jesus by the Holy Spirit. He also made another temple. That's us collectively as the temple of God. It's in the Bible. You're going to read it now and learn doctrine, inspiration and part of it, and you're going to learn how to then apply this to yourself, and then you're going to learn some background as well. You see, the Word of God is teaching us that, hey, we are the temple of God together because we all, as believers, have the Holy Spirit. That's why it feels different, Steve. There's something different. You can't figure it out. It's okay. In the Word of God, you'll learn in the next 20 or 30 years when you're about 90-ish, 80-something, you'll know more. We open up the Bible, we learn a little more. We learn a little more. We learn a little more. God speaks to us, we learn a little more. We learn a little more. Now we understand that we are the temple of God. We are his building. He says, Paul said, we are God's building. God is very concerned how we build our life in Christ and the life of his church. Is he not? Yes, he is. Do we take this seriously at all? God is very concerned about how we build our life. That was a prompt. God is concerned on how we build it. There you go. God is concerned, very concerned, how you and I build our life in Christ and build our life in his life in this church. Do we take this seriously? Do you? You are responsible to everyone in here, believers. I bet you haven't heard anybody say that to you lately. I am responsible to all you. You're the pastor guy. Oh, but we're responsible to each other. We're to hold one another up, lift one another up, pray for one another, to be by your side, to care for the other person, to say, I'm in this with you, and I'm not going to leave you, and I'm not going to let you hang. I'm with you. It's a beautiful thing in the Spirit of God. That's what Paul is trying to get them back. You know what the wisdom of the world says? Ah, forget about them. They got their own life, and I got my own life, and I'm not very good with people, and I don't like people, and people don't like me. Really, you're going to use that? You're going to use that? Come on now. Jesus was a people. He is a people. And one day you're going to see him. And he'll be more than people then. And you'll say, Father, Son, forgive me. I could have. 
taking you more seriously than I did. Now you wonder what happened to me for a few weeks. This is serious. I say it once. This is really serious stuff. And Paul's saying, we started this church at 52. It's four or five years later. I'm writing back a letter, and you've lost it all already. How quickly can we lose it? I say that to you. You can lose it so quickly. So quickly. One by one. One by one. That's the title of our message today. From messy business to one by one. That is the name of our discipleship ministry on the first level of you growing. One by one. Doing life with the doctrines of the Bible. We'll come back to that in a minute. You see, and all of that is an introduction. I'm going to read this passage, point out four simple things, and allow you to respond to what the Spirit of God has for you. Do you and I take this seriously? Lost person, do you take the fact that you will die and go to hell without Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you take that seriously? Saved person, do you take seriously that when you take your last breath, you will see the one that saved your soul? And so then every man will give an account of himself. Pastor Dwayne read a passage out of Philippians 2, 5 through 13. Love that stuff. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. It's going to have to be one by one. This is the second half of our two-part message. So here you go. It's a few weeks later, but we haven't lost anything because the Word of God's right before us. I want you to follow along with me. Start in verse number 10. We already read verse number 9 as an introduction. Verse number 10. Here we go. Paul speaking to the church at Corinth says... According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. Paul is the one that he is saying. Paul's the master builder here. We're going to find out what foundation he laid by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he's saying, by his grace, God gave it to me that I would be the master builder of the work at Corinth. This guy has a sense of responsibility and accountability, and he's serious about it. We need more seriousness like this. He says in the second part of verse number 10, But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Build upon what? He says, I have laid a foundation, another buildeth thereon, which is the other people that are leaders and teachers in the word of God in the church. Disciple makers, all that. I left it for them to build thereupon. You didn't take their teaching as a man of God. You didn't teach the disciple, you didn't take the disciple making as being of a godly thing. You said, oh, I'm going to be of Cephas because he's better. I'm going to be of Apollos because he's better. How about if we just take it and say, it's of the Lord Jesus Christ. As he said, God gives the increase. God did the work. We continue in verse number 11. This verse was the centerpiece of uh, Conference, an Acts 1-8 conference we had back in 2013. If you look on the wall on the south side, you'll see that it's there, that card's there. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We wouldn't want to build on anyone else but Jesus Christ. Now if any man built upon this foundation... Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. He's saying, look, I'm the the master builder. I laid a foundation. The foundation is Jesus. Verse number 11 says that we don't want man to lay anything else but the foundation of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The church is founded on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the bride's savior. He then says in verse number 12 and 13 and 14, hey, 
You're going to build, build. Well, we just talked about that. We are God's building. We are God's husbandry. We're the ground that he is tilling and working and we're to build. And we have a personal responsibility to say, yes, God, build me. Yes, God, do what you need to do to make me to become more like Jesus Christ. That is, of course, referring, and this is a strong application here, but it's not the only application, but it's clear that we have a judgment seat of Christ reference here, a judgment that's coming one day, and that's clear that every man's work shall be manifest, and the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a word. Verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Doctrinally very clear, very clear. The person here that's being spoken to is the person that's in the building, the believer in Christ. You are sealed once you are saved. How do you get saved? Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. The heart believes, the mouth confesses, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What are you calling on him for? For forgiveness, for redemption, as you turn from your way of attempting to save yourself and you turn to him to be saved. And then, believer, remember that? When you're born again, you got saved. Child, teenager, elementary age, teenager, older adult. And now you're being spoken to here in the church and you are the believer in the church and you're being told, your work will abide which hath built thereon. He shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Hay would stubble. Would that burn in a fire? Yes. Those are the works that are done with the wrong motivation, the wrong heart attitude. They're done just for surfacy accolades and manly recognition they're done without Jesus and God's glory being done in those works and in those actions but on the other side the gold silver and precious stones those are things that you give glory to God for it may be that it is some kind of crown that's in the New Testament a shepherd's crown a soul winner's crown those type of crowns and all that judgment, you're going, that judgment, see, yeah, there is going to come a day where all that we have done as a believer, and then it will determine not that you're saved or not. You can't lose that. You are saved, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So there are some people that spent very little time since they were born again at 16 years old to do anything that is eternally lasting as more than just wood, hay, and stubble. That would encourage you. That encourages me. That tells me I need to do that which will be pleasing to the Lord so that it is gold, silver, and precious stones. Because again, those things that are vanity, vexation of spirit, a waste of time, those things will not before eternal rewards. He continues in saying something very powerful in verses 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? And if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. That's a personal reference and a temple of God reference to all of us collectively as a church, both ways. When you get to 1 Corinthians 6, now he becomes <laughs> really personal. Because now it's Holy Spirit of God stuff. And it's really just you personally walking as a believer in what that means. Here he's saying, personally, you're born again. You are saved. You have the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. You are his. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. But collectively and corporately, church, we are his temple. 
house to house, in the temple, the early church gathered. They were taught early by the Holy Spirit of God that that's what they were supposed to do because they're converted to Jesus Christ. And that's where they have to gather together. That's the spot. That was the place. But they realized that they were, when they gathered together in the name of Jesus, they were the temple of God. Now here we are sitting going, what does it mean to defile the temple of God? That's personal. But what is it that God sees in us that we would defile his church? That we would hurt his church? That now comes down. I don't have to say anything else other than to read the scriptures. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. It doesn't say that he's going to send them into hell because they're now condemned. That's not what it's saying. Destroy means very simply their life will be taken. The temple of God is holy. Which temple are ye? Ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Well, I'm saved, I'm born again, but it doesn't really matter to God. He's so gracious and he's so forgiving, and he's fine if I just spend all my time on the things that I love. Okay. That's your choice. He doesn't get a whole lot of glory out of that. I'm not here threatening you with a man or carnal statement. I'm telling you what the Bible says. And you and I as a born-again believer, don't deceive yourself, verse 18. I wonder where I've heard that before. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He was speaking that to the church at Galatia. The churches at Galatia. This is to the church. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Why don't you put away this worldly stuff that you continue to hold on? Well, I have my other ways of growing, and I have my other ways of worshiping, and I have my other ways. If it's against the Bible, it is going to be vanity. It is going to be a waste of time. If it's against the word of God, and it does give him glory and honor and praise, because the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise. He knows me. He knows you. And he has a greater investment in you now that you're born again and you're one of his children. Yes, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but his long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish. Yes. So he's concerned about the loss, but he's even more concerned about his children. He really is. You are his. And he is yours. And he finishes out this chapter by saying, therefore let no man glory in men. <laughs> For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death. This has got everything covered. Or things present or things to come. All are yours and ye are Christ's and Christ is God's. So very simply, by mathematics, everything is God's. <laughs> and I'm Christ and you're Christ, believers. So here I am being held accountable and responsible to God. One by one, one by one. One by one, we're to grow. One by one, one by one, we're to learn and grow to be more like Jesus. One by one, we need to put down the world's wisdom. One by one, we're to look at what it means for disciple making in my life. Discipleship is really, really important. Learning how to walk. Listen. I am so thankful for all of you that serve God. I really am. I, I can't tell you the percentage of people at First Bible that jump in on serving. All the volunteers at the charity golf tour, all the people that will come to build out bed, beds. Thank you. You want to serve and you want to serve. And many of you are strong in the word, but many of you are not. All you do is serve. And serving is good, but it's all you do. How about if you grow a little bit? We are telling me all of us have to be teachers. I did not say that. I said, why don't you grow a little bit more in the Lord and maybe he will just take your life in a whole other direction. Do you remember the theme of the Acts 1-8 conference? It was ten and a half months ago, a holy calling. God has called so many of you and you have said no. 
God has spoken to so many of you, and so you stop reading the Word of God, you stop going forward, and that one by one, I couldn't get somebody to get with me, I couldn't get somebody, just if you're persistent on this thing, in the meantime, while you're waiting for someone to say yes, again, as I say earlier, why don't you just pick up the Bible and get after it? And as I said before, just call and reach out to somebody. So let me just walk through these things in the next few minutes. They will take just two or three minutes each. You've already gotten a background of the passage, so I just want to hit, hit these and then read you a passage of Scripture that supports our lesson thoughts, our lesson points. One by one, the first thing is that in verse number 10 and 11, I see that Jesus frames our basement for a temple life. He frames our basement for a temple life. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Go to Ephesians chapter number 2. Jesus Christ is the one that frames our basement for a temple life. Your personal temple, your collective temple. It says truly and clearly in your Bible who the framer is of the foundation. He is called the foundation, but he's also framing everything. It says in Hebrews 11.3, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Who's the word of God? He is. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. He is the framer. He frames our basement. We have a basement that we need to have built up. We need to have the basement for temple life done. And in Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 19, it says, Now therefore you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You guys are saints. You were strangers, you were foreigners, and now you're in the household of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So many that have gone before you. Verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. In whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Why would we look for anything else? Why would there be more that we need than what we have in Christ in his church? He has fitly framed everything together. He has said that everything comes off of me. I am the foundation. I have framed it. Now your temple life that you have. I heard that we were priests of the royal priesthood. There's an incredible importance to the foundation of the building and how it's framed. Jesus is the foundation specifically. That's, listen, this church... Uh, not to be involved in anything other than what Jesus Christ has framed us to be part of. A church that isn't involved in this kind of ministry, it goes out of business. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. You go looking for another truth and some other truth, and I'm going to create some fun church, and I'm going to create something else. It's Jesus Christ alone. It is truly Jesus that frames our basement for a temple life. Do we have a temple life personally? And do we have a temple life collectively? We need to grow in that area. Could we do that a little bit? This is not a message to end all things to say, okay, gosh, everything's such a mess. No, it's an encouragement from Paul to the Corinthian church. And it's an encouragement from the Holy Spirit to the believer today to say, hey, Jesus Christ and his foundation has framed things. And he is the one, the word of God, that framed the worlds that we're operating in. The second thing, Bible doctrine ensures our basics for a sanctified life. Bible doctrine ensures our basics for a sanctified life. Here you go. Let me go to page number, okay, let me keep on going. Page, page number 29, the will of God. How do I find out what God's, God wants me to do? That's on page 29, okay? It goes for a few pages, goes on and on and on. There's a lot of scripture in there. Lesson eight, the local church. What does the local church provide me that nothing else can? A temple life. How to live it right. 
how to be fitly framed together. Oh, I know. We got it all down pat, right? We're all set. No, we're not. That's not being mean. That's not being mean. That's saying, hey, we got an incredible church, incredible family, incredible. The way you worship God and the way you serve God and the way you desire things of God, we just to have more of that. What do you mean more? Tomorrow, let's do it again. And the next day, let's do it again. And the next day, let's do it again. Hey, lesson 11, money and possessions. How does God want me to view my earthly possessions? Page 49, stewardship. Can you turn to a few passages of Scripture and tell me how that goes? My point, one by one, lordship, law and liberty, doctrines of the word of God, being a servant's one thing, Knowing the doctrines and another, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 1 through 3. It's just a few pages back from chapter number 3. He says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sothenes, I mentioned him earlier, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. He is saying, hey, you've been sanctified. You've been born again, so you have salvation, sanctification. Now you have this walk with God the Lord, that grows you to be sanctified in your life. Some of you have hardly ever grown in the Word of God. You're still stuck on milk doctrine instead of the meat doctrine. With all that is in every place, call upon the name of our Lord Jesus, excuse me, Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you, peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Bible doctrine ensures what? A sanctified life. If you do not have that sanctified life, then you can be tossed around with every wind of doctrine. Just because there's a percentage of people that know the Bible well and can teach it really well here does not mean that we have the sanctified life and the temple that God would have us to have. Bible doctrine ensures our basics, the sanctified life. As I said earlier, as a shepherd, I appreciate, I applaud all of you that serve. But that, if that is all, there can be more. Continue to serve, but grow. Get a little deeper while you're serving. I heard that's a good way to go. Thirdly, Holy Spirit. You know what the Holy Spirit does? He adjudicates. He manages overseas with the truth of something. He adjudicates our baseline for a valued life. What's the baseline of our valued life? The baseline is how you and I are born again, saved, and have the Holy Spirit working with the Word of God in our lives. It'll give you direction, give you passion. The word definition of passion means suffering. So he's going to give you that, but it's the proper suffering, the suffering of the Lord, the suffering in the Lord. He's going to give you a place of edification, building up, building up. That's that valued life that you'll have. And so you'll have gold, silver, precious stones. That'll come from that. That'll come from there. But then as the warning comes in verse 16 and 17, realize that that's what's tied this together. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple are ye? Which temple are you? Value comes in the walk and the worship that leads to the proper kind of work. Romans chapter number 8, verses 1 and 2 say this. What a beautiful statement of Paul the Apostle about our salvation. There is therefore no condemnation. There's now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There's no condemnation to you that are born again. If you're lost, there's condemnation. But there's therefore no more condemnation. Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Think about it. The law of the spirit of life in Christ, in Christ Jesus, the law of life. You're born again, the spirit life comes in, and now you're regenerated, right? You know this to be true. Now you're free from the law of sin and death, so you're not spiritually dead, and you're not condemned. Go down to verse number 5. 
For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. That's what gives us in this baseline, this incredible valued life. You say, well, my valued life is in all the things that I've been able to do through my job and through work or through my family, and that's fine. But the value comes in eternal things. What are we doing that's eternal? What am I doing that's eternal? The souls, the lives, the disciples that need to grow beyond the milk to a place of meat so God can then use them. If there's only ten people that are born again, but those ten people then say, hey, I really want this life that the fruit of the Spirit can give me and this life that says that, that I can do things that are after the Spirit because I have the Spirit, so I walk in the Spirit as I am in the Spirit. Okay. Then the Holy Spirit gives me this and He gives me the ability to have this life that's full of spiritual value in the midst of the world crumbling some of the most happy spirit filled eternal thinking people I have known in my life are people that had absolutely no value on this earth whether it was a car or a house or anything and lastly the wisdom of God navigates our base path for a ministry life the basement the basics, those are good. Just a few, few little B words that we have in there. We have a baseline that the Holy Spirit adjudicates and manages and watch over to do what's right. And then here comes the wisdom of God to navigate our base path for ministry life. Let no man deceive himself. In verse 18, if any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world... On and on it goes. I mentioned it earlier. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. People that are wise in this world, if you, hey, got all this great wisdom in the world, well, that's good if it applies to you making a good living. Hallelujah. But if it comes to your spirit life and the temple of God working and you guys really saying, okay, I, I've got it all down, then you're going to feel that emptiness and that emptiness. And then you say, well, I want to get into ministry. I want to serve. Boy, this ministry stuff is really hard. Serving and doing things for people is really hard. Discipling people and teaching the Bible and being part of children's ministry and being part of youth ministry and, and doing things and, and going to salt and light and going to talk to people and visit people and, and being able to be part of anything. It gets to be so hard. Why? Because we didn't get the wisdom of God. We had the wisdom of ourselves, the wisdom of this world, the wisdom of other men to navigate us when we need the wisdom of God to navigate us through the pace path for ministry life. I get saved. I'm willing to be a living sacrifice. I become a servant, and then I'm sanctified. And your sanctification's ongoing. Go to Ephesians chapter number 4, and I'll finish right here. It's a familiar passage for many of you. I'll have part of it up on the screen in a minute. But Ephesians chapter number 4. Again, it comes back to what these churches are all going through. You study the Bible and you reread the Bible and you study again and then you study again. You take an institute class, you take a Bible class, you take some type of Wednesday night Bible study, you take a men's study, you do those things, you go, wait a minute, it keeps on coming back because God is teaching us through his letters and the word, by Paul the Apostle, by the Spirit of God, that we need this constant reminder. God's wisdom is a game changer, is a life changer. The Holy Spirit is the one that can keep that baseline right. Jesus Christ is the basis. He is the framer of our foundation and our basement. And when I look at the doctrines that are needed for you and I, it goes to Ephesians 4. All comes back around to the wisdom of God. Verse number 11 says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now stop right there for all of you that have heard that verse and those passages a hundred times and said, I've taught it and I know it all. Just let the Spirit of God again just talk to you. Let him show you 
how strong these words are. He's given all of that for the temple of God, personally and collectively, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. I heard that the edifying meant building, the building of the body. Body being built. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth, why? Be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Paul warning the Corinthian church. Paul warning the Ephesus church. Paul being used by the Spirit of God in these letters. Here's God's word speaking to you and me clearly right now in this moment saying, you don't need to be a child that's tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. You think the cunning craftiness hasn't gotten some of us? It's gotten you. You believe things you never would have believed 20 years ago. I'm not talking about biblical things. I'm glad that you're studying the word of God. Keep on studying it. Whereby they lay in wait to deceive. They want to deceive us. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him and all things which is the head, even Christ. Here it is, verse number 16. I know, again, well, I've heard this thing and I've taught it through. From whom the whole body fitly joined together, that's us, compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. There it is. Love never fails. Love never fails. It says up on the screen this. When I think about challenging you at the end here today, I think about go ahead and put up the next slide please. One by one, we build the body of Christ, the temple of God, his church. So the question comes, and I was finishing up last message, and Steve was coming to be baptized, and I said, how are you doing? Maybe some of you heard that. Maybe you're getting a second dose. How are you doing with building your personal temple and our collective temple? Some of you just wandering through this life. Eh. Some of you are saying, I'm not wandering through life. I am passionate about Jesus Christ in every way. That's a good way to build your personal temple and your collective temple, the temple of God. Why don't you bow your heads for a word of prayer? As the music begins to play, let me talk to you and then just pray and give you a chance to respond. Go ahead. How are you doing with building your personal temple? How are you doing with the temple principle of your church? Miserable? stuck. We'll get to things later with the Lord. Or, pastor doing great. Want to keep on going. Amen. The question is, for all of us, could we do a little bit more in the Lord because we take this really seriously and we have a responsibility. Our Father in heaven at this time, as things are coming to a close, it's still time to do business with you. Jesus, you are at the right hand of the Father. You are our mediator. You are the one. And you've given us everything that we need by your word and by your spirit. And I thank you. I pray you just work in this precious time, work by your spirit, work in your people. 
maybe there's someone here today that would love to respond and be saved. Maybe this would be the day when someone would respond and say, I want to be discipled. Maybe this would be the day when someone just says, I want to disciple others. How are we doing with building our temple? I pray, God, that once again, you will work and have your way over the next couple minutes in Jesus' name. Please stand. Please respond as God would have you. There's a place that you can come and pray right here. Come right ahead. Said, hey, I, I have some questions. I will stand up here and wait. I know Bobby will. Brian will be here. I have questions afterwards. Please come and respond as God would have you to come. Please come.